And it was at that time when I went to try to get out of bed to go to the emergency room, I totally went paralyzed for the first time ever. Totally could not move anything. It's very typical of periodic paralysis to take a long time to diagnose, to see many doctors. It was very difficult. Um, we didn't know why, what had happened. Um, I had C-sections with my children, and so we were home, and I just couldn't move my feet. I got up to go to the bathroom, and I couldn't move. And I went to the emergency room. Um, they obviously could tell that there was something serious going on. They thought I had meningitis, and they did a spinal tap. We went to the hospital, and they had no idea. Like, they ran tests, and they couldn't figure it out. They... They thought I had had a stroke because I had facial palsy. Um, my blood pressure would skyrocket over 200 for no reason. At the time, they had no idea why. They would try to induce the attacks and we, they couldn't induce them. Like I would have them, but they couldn't make them happen. And they didn't understand that either. So at first when they don't understand it, they just send you to a psychiatrist. Um, that was the first time I was diagnosed with a psychogenic or psychological disorder. They thought it was psycho psychological. There's basically nothing wrong with your head. You know, I don't know what's wrong with your body, but, you know, you may have stress in your life anyway. And you go through that cycle over and over. I went through that cycle for 18 years, and that's so hard. The diagnosis of periodic paralysis remains a challenge even with the advent of new uh, gene testing and increased awareness of the disease. There are several unique features of the disorder itself that continue to cause this to be a problem. First is the fact that it's so rare. It occurs in only about three or 4,000 individuals in the United States. So most physicians do not have experience in making a diagnosis and interacting face-to-face -face with an individual with periodic paralysis. They might have heard about it on a website or read about it, but actually seeing a patient is a rare event and this makes the diagnosis challenging. A second challenge to arriving at the diagnosis is that in between attacks, muscle function is normal. So when the individual comes for an assessment in the outpatient clinic, the examination is completely normal, including detailed tests of strength and reflexes. And so there's no objective uh, clinical sign that the neurologist can hang his hat on and say, oh yes, I'm concerned this is a case of periodic paralysis. So an abnormal value of a blood potassium test is very informative. It's helpful at arriving at the diagnosis, but a normal value is not helpful. It doesn't exclude the possibility of periodic paralysis. So this is another difficulty in the diagnosis. Another challenge comes from gene testing. So this is an inherited disorder with dominant inheritance, many specific mutations have been identified. The availability of commercial gene testing has improved dramatically in the last several years. So you would think, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. I'm going to get the answer. But the problem is the instructions, the gene for the ion channel that's involved in periodic paralysis has over 6,000 different individual letters in that set of instructions. And there can be many variations that are innocuous, that are normal, so-called variants of unknown significance. So even though the sophisticated gene tests may identify something unique about your DNA, it's another question as to whether that change is responsible for your symptoms. So uh, this is just a, a way of explaining the fact that gene testing is very helpful, but doesn't always provide the final answer. I will also add, many times clinicians are very confident about a diagnosis. So someone has recurrent episodes of weakness, they're aggravated by carbohydrate ingestion, the blood potassium is low during the attacks of weakness. Multiple family members are affected. This is hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And yet the gene tests come back normal. No variation detected. What are we to do with that? Well, it's still a clinically high probability case of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. But the reality is 
there are either other genes affected that we don't understand yet, we still need to discover, or there are variations in the genetic code that we don't know how to relate to function of the channel yet. And so it's an unrecognized problem with the gene. So again, while genetic testing is highly specific and when an abnormality is detected, it's very informative, it's not the be all to end all, it is not the panacea here uh, because there are these variations in the genetic code. So if I'm concerned about having periodic paralysis, what can I do to help my medical team arrive at an accurate diagnosis? This is an area where proactive measures by the individual can be very helpful. Things like start a diary, record accurately how frequently are your attacks occurring, how severe are those. Instead of just saying I was weak all over or I was tired, give examples of specific things you can or cannot do. I couldn't stand up by myself. I couldn't raise my um, arm to my face or I couldn't pick up a heavy suitcase. Another helpful thing is to uh, ask other members of your family and make a family tree and understand what other individuals are affected. It's also helpful uh, to take a video sample. So if during an episode, a family member can take a, a video of the difficulties you're having, um, that can be of uh, tremendous assistance at arriving at a diagnosis. So if you're in that frustrating situation where you're just not confident whether a diagnosis of periodic paralysis has been accurately made in your situation or with your family, what should you do? Where should you turn? what options are out there. I would advocate that it's very important to be evaluated by a neurologist, and in particular, a neuromuscular specialist. So neurologists go on to subspecialty training in neuromuscular disease, and these are the experts who are best equipped to make the diagnosis. They've perhaps seen patients with periodic paralysis and have the equipment necessary to do the detailed electrical testing of muscle to arrive at a diagnosis. The diagnosis of periodic paralysis remains a clinical challenge and many individuals are frustrated with the fact that they're in limbo. They have symptoms and their doctor uh, is not comfortable making a diagnosis. Well, where can you go? Where can you turn? This is where organizations like the Periodic Paralysis Association are very helpful. You can converse with other members find out whether the symptoms you're experiencing are similar to others who have a definitive diagnosis of periodic paralysis. Am I like that person? Is the, is the likelihood high? Do they know of clinicians who have experience in making the diagnosis and seeing the patients? They can help with referrals. They can act as a sounding board uh, to help you interpret the symptoms you're experiencing. And importantly, they can give you advice on whether you should still push hard and seek out medical experts, neuromuscular specialists, who can try and think critically and help to determine definitively whether or not you have a diagnosis of periodic paralysis. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.